We thought we'd just sort of welcome you with a fast-paced little tune from down Tennessee Way. We rolled in on a tour bus this morning. We got here about 6.30 or 7 a.m., I think. We left Nashville about uh, 11.30 last night. Um, slept like little babies in our berths <laughs> with our curtains pulled. The, uh, the bunk this week, did you notice? Normally we have a, a button fastener, but this week it's magnetized. It kind of sucked in really loudly and, and unexpectedly as I closed my curtain. I closed it and then it just went whack. I know. It like, it's the little things, y'all. Yeah. The other nice piece is the pneumatic doors that feel very Star Trek. Shh, shh. Yeah. But you don't want to get stuck on one because they don't like retract if you get stuck yeah. in the pneumatic slide. You can door. crack nuts with them too. Thanks, y'all. It's early yet. <laughs> That'll get the blood flowing on a Friday afternoon. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, guys. That was awesome. And, and we're going to play a couple more songs kind of intertwined throughout some of the questioning. So really appreciate that. Let me start kind of we got a lot to talk about today. You guys have so much going on. And I'm super excited um, to kind of got, get through some of that. Let's start with where you're at now. You guys uh, have had a busy summer. You guys were at uh, Bonnaroo as part of the Grand Old Opry. Uh, you've been on the uh, Outlaw Tour with Willie Nelson and friends, uh, including the Avet Brothers, who were in here not too long ago with us. Um, and now you're going out on a, a headlining tour starting here in Detroit tonight. Um, first of all, a, a nice kind of behind the scenes story uh, or question. Any stories about Willie Nelson on the road? Any good stories from, from backstage? Well, we've been playing a lot this summer with Willie, and he's, it's so amazing going out and following and eating the dust of the Red-Headed Strangers tour bus across thousands of miles of barren American countryside. And um, You know, when, when this band first started, um, I met Willie Nelson when I was 18 at Merle Watson Festival, and uh, he came out of the bus, you know, I was waiting for him, and I had a copy of my new record and it seemed unfathomable that there would ever be a, a universe in which we would actually be on the same tour or, or know each other or, or that he would someday hand me a harmonica and say, now's your turn to blow the solo um, <laughs> or like sing a little louder or give me a hug or any of those things that happened. Because when it first started, I was 18 and due to the conditions of the choices I had made earlier in the evening, I was having a hard time standing and I got up to the bus, which sort of broke my fall. And Willie came down, and, and he was so sweet and genuine. And you know that feeling when you need something to focus on so you won't fall? For me, that was Willie Nelson. <laughs> and like, I just kept zeroing in on him. And, and then we got our picture made, which is unusual for me because I'm not a f f photographic type. Um, but uh, somebody, somebody there said, let me snap your picture. And in the photograph, we're both wearing black cowboy hats with turquoise stones in the middle. <laughs> and as soon as the photograph got um, um, printed and given to me, I felt that I needed to get rid of it right away because it, it just felt like taboo to have this dream of mine be you know, articulated so perfectly that, you know, because someday I was going to play with Willie Nelson. So I gave it away to this, to this old woman whose house I was squatting in, um, and she put it on her monitor heater. And you all who are from the South know, and maybe also from the UP know, that the position of the monitor heater, a photograph that goes on your monitor heater, is the most important <laughs> thing in your life. 
So the fact that she pushed away all her children's high school graduations to make sure that the boy squatting in her house next to Willie Nelson was in that prominent spot. That's incredible. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know where to go from there. That's a great story. Yeah. So many years after, we found ourselves knowing Willie Nelson. And, and in fact, we should sing a little Willie Nelson while we're talking about oh, it. I would love that. Why don't Perfect. Yeah, let's do it. Look at that segue. The one I've been really liking that he's been singing lately is Roll Me Up and Smoke Me When I Die. <laughs> What's your favorite Willie Nelson song, Joe? Oh, gosh. Mm. I got one. In the twilight glow, I see her. Blue eyes crying in the rain. When we kissed goodbye and parted, I knew. We'd never meet again. Love is like a dying ember. Only memories remain. Through the ages, I remember. eyes crying in the rain thank you so much guys Willie's great because he he's the only guy I think the only artist that can get away with having his walk on music for his concerts and his walk off music both be Willie Nelson <laughs> <laughs> that's a rarity right yeah that's when you know you've made it, right? That's right. To the mountaintop. Um, when you guys are playing a festival like Outlaw with Willie and a bunch of other great acts, is, is that something you guys prefer, is being part of a lineup, being, you know, it, today's uh, musical world festivals and lineup tours are really big these days, or do you guys prefer more of an intimate setting where you guys are headlining? Or does it does not matter to you, I guess, maybe somewhere in between. Well, variety is the spice of life, right? So it's really fun to get to do all of those things, to get to go out with Willie Nelson and, and, uh, and not just Willie, but his wonderful family band that's been with him. Some of these members have been with him for more than 40 years. Right. Um, and then his sister's been with him for a lifetime. So, uh, and then, you know, y you never know. Who, you're going to wake up in a new town each day, but you're always going to go to the catering place and find your pals from the night before. <laughs> right. And then the other thing is that when you've been in a band for 21 years, like I've been in, you get tired of them boys. <laughs> and so it's just nice to wake up to somebody else's breath, <laughs> bedhead, or, you know, sassy attitude. Sure. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> you, guys, uh, you guys mentioned <laughs> driving up to Detroit from Nashville last night. And... Uh, in Nashville, as you guys well know, is the country or the, the, the holy church of country music, the Ryman Auditorium. You guys have played there 40 plus times. It's got to be close to a record, maybe. Um, and I know you guys do your New Year's Eve show every year. They're my, uh, my brother and sister, uh, sister in law who could not be here today and who were sorely missing this uh, have been to many of those shows and are coming this year so that I know that they really enjoy those shows. Um, that segues into your new album, right? That is, uh, or has just been released or just been mentioned of the release um, live at the Ryman. Can you tell us a little bit more about that album? And, and if you want to talk about the Ryman as well, we'd always be all ears on that. Y'all ever heard of the, the, the Ryman Auditorium? Yeah, so this, they call it the mother church of country music. One of the things I love about the Ryman is that um, it was built by divine decree as opposed to the Hotel Park Avenue here, which was <laughs> built by a boardroom decision. But see, now, this guy, he was a riverboat captain, Tom Ryman, right? And like a sin and licentious kind of dude. Like, this guy is making money hand over fist. He's got charlatans and harlots all working for him. He's making money in the riverboat trade uh, all through Nashville and all across Kentucky, making all this dough. Well, one day in like 1880, 
he goes to a tent revival and he sees the great uh, preacher Sam Jones and Sam inspires him and he goes out one day and he hears the voice of God saying Tom Ryman build me a tabernacle right so this cat he he's like I'm gonna give up all my wicked ways and I'm gonna build a, a church for everybody and so he builds the Union Gospel Tabernacle at the corner of Fifth and uh, Broadway in downtown Nashville and uh, this is becomes the theater where Charlie Chaplin plays where Burt Williams plays where Martin Luther King and Teddy Roosevelt play uh, you know, everybody goes there. Lillian Gish and, and then that uh, uh, Jenny Lynn, the Swedish Nightingale. And, and that's just in the first like 20 years of the, of the new uh, century. By the time we come around, you know, like the Pogues are playing and the Pixies and uh, who else? The Raconteurs and the Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> yeah. And, um, 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 and the Wiggles live. That's right. <laughs> Said that for you two. <laughs> and Peppa Pig also. Ooh. On a forty dollar ticket. Now come on, what's a kid show for four that's like a trip to Disneyland. Anyway, so it has become a multi use facility that has this wonderful um origin story and every time we play there it's just it's haunted with ghosts. Hank Williams and oh they're all there. You can just feel them all. Um, the, you know, it's one of those if the walls could talk kind of places. And much like this, this skyline that I'm looking out at, um, it, you know, it's a resemblant of that sort of belief in let's build something that's going to last forever and always be populated and always be a community builder. And, you know, I look out and I see things that are not currently occupied, not all of them, but certainly some of them aren't. Um, the Ryman has stayed currently occupied all these years but there was a time in which nashville was totally ready to tear it down because nashville had left downtown and so there you know they, they, it, it was almost a done deal you know they opened up the new grand Ole opry house out west of town that's sort of like um sort of like y'all suburb you know the one out there by the lake where your uncle lives um the one that's got that good job and that pretty daughter what's his name <laughs> Just say something. Steubenville? <laughs> That's a real outer suburb. <laughs> That's a stretch. Steubenville, Ohio yeah, is no, a stretch. No, I don't know where. Yeah. Okay. And also, it's the Opry is, is east of town. But that's the direction of... Well, never been a direction guy. With the He's from Alabama, y'all. <laughs> that's right. So speak slowly. <laughs> Are you waiting for something? No, was I, was just think, I was thinking about Sorry. what happens when you Google Alabama. Like how You don't want to know what happens when you Google <laughs> Alabama. Anyway, the, the Ryman lasted, and we've just put this new album out on Columbia Records, celebrating 40, celebrating our many years of playing there, and, uh, and it's, it sounds really great. It's a beautiful live record. Got some special guests on it. The, the harmonica king, Lee Oscar, uh, Charlie Worsham, and uh, oh, uh, Margot Price, who, uh, who you'll love. Yeah. She's, a, she's something of a Jenny Lind herself. I think Molly Tuttle's on there. Mm -hmm. That's great. When's it come out? October 4th. October 4th. Cool. And it's right. coming out to coincide with this wonderful film that is also coming out in September on PBS. It's called Country Music by Ken Burns. Yeah. It's a 16-hour flick, y'all. <laughs> He's been working on it for eight years. He conducted 160 interviews. And of those 160 interviews, roughly 25% of the interviewees have died. <laughs> so, man, this thing is it's legit. And I've been waiting for somebody to tell the story of country music with that outsider perspective and the America's most beloved documentarian is the guy for the job. I'm an advisor to the film and I'm, I'm in the film. This is going to be a really exciting time to get to see my, uh, my, eight, year old, my eight years ago self. <laughs> I still got a little baby fat in the shot. It's a little <laughs> embarrassing. And that, that comes out September 15th, right? I believe. Yeah, that reminds me, I should say that my mom is here. <laughs> as long as we're talking about my chubby baby fat, I might as well make reference to my parents who have joined us from Toledo. Welcome, Jay and Trina. Speaking of Alabama, did I tell you that Sam Jones is a, a, a far distant cousin? Of You're mine? related to Sam Jones? Yeah. The man who convinced Tom Ryman to give up his sin in licentious ways? Can you believe that? Wow. Did very, very far distant past, but... 
true. Joe's from Anniston, Alabama, and oh my God, we just played his hometown. <laughs> Y'all should have seen the scene. Yeah, what it, it was, a, it was something to behold. <laughs> Everyone is in a tux, right? At at the old high school, and they've all and Joe's parents are like the sponsors of this gig, and no one plays Anniston, Alabama. It's a it's a very formal, long-standing concert series that is usually classical or musical based performances so, so we come out yeah, singing come about out. cocaine and whiskey and <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of sin and licentious things yeah and they don't know what to do no idea crickets you know usually people cheer when we come out on stage for the you know the opening of the show the lights dim we come out everyone's like yay and they're just it's just silence dead silence <laughs> they're like waiting for the big reveal and we're like it's us we're here <laughs> It was awkward. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have always been very keen on honoring kind of country music and, and what it is and who it is. And Catch, you did a, a TED talk not too long ago that I watched. It was quite good. Um, and talks a little bit about how you know country music is American music, but it includes inspiration from all over. Can you talk a little bit more about about that and you, know, you kind of talked a little bit about origin stories with the Ryman you kind of tying that into what you did with Ken Burns and, and really what being a part of country music uh, and bringing so much else to that means to you guys sure thanks I gave a TED talk back in uh, March when they when the TEDx uh, group came to Nashville and and they wondered what I should wanted to talk about and I I knew right away what I wanted to speak on um, and I'll tell you the, my, my idea came to me from the Country Music Hall of Fame. Now, I was there for the medallion ceremony, which every year all these stars and executives gather to honor somebody who exemplifies country music. And in this case, the new crop that year was um, a guy named Fred Foster, who's a producer for Dolly Parton and many others, a real, or just a super innovative record maker, and, and then Charlie Daniels, the fiddler, and a couple other guys, um, uh, Randy Travis, I think, among them. So anyway, I'm in this room and I'm, I'm hearing all these amazing stories. And Dolly's there and Chris Christopherson sings. Uh, we should do his song in a minute because um, I'm always thinking about Chris Christopherson. So everyone's having such a great time and they're telling these amazing stories. So like I learned that Dolly Parton, that, that her father paid the obstetrician in cornmeal when she was born. And then I'm learning from, can you dig that? <laughs> like it was a birth barter, <laughs> y'all. So, uh, and then Charlie um, Daniels is there, and you know, Charlie talks about, uh, or Brenda Lee, remember her, Little Miss Dynamite? Sure. She's about y'all's height, but she's 90. <laughs> and she's still got it. She's uh, this amazing singer. Um, and so she's talking about Charlie Daniels and brings him on, and about how he grew up, you know, learning to read on the Bible and his coal oil lamp and all this stuff. But I'm looking around, and everybody at, the Country Music Hall of Fame, except who's on the stage, looks like they work at Google Detroit. <laughs> in that they likely did not pay in, in, ch in chicken or feed for their births, and likely had electricity and plumbing through all of their childhood, let alone their adulthood. Um, and so everyone looks like they got a good degree and a good job and dental work and you know an attractive bunch of people. And I'm looking around and I just don't see anybody that looks like they're part of this country music m mythology. Because everyone looks like me or, or y'all. But then I go out because it's time for me to go. And I, now I don't have a smartphone. I'm a flip phone user. <laughs> Come on, don't be ashamed, Anyone Google. Anyone? Y'all all know you wish that y'all <laughs> had a Blackberry like me. So I go out because I can't hail an Uber because that doesn't work on my flip phone. So I gotta get me a cab, and so I get a cab, and a man from Sudan picks me up, and right away I can see that this man grew up in a life pathway so much closer to Dolly Parton and Charlie, Pry and Charlie Daniels than anybody in that room full of stars and executives. And that's when it started to occur to me, oh man, I gotta do something about this. Nashville is a immigrant city. Nashville is a refugee city. And we have people from all over the world who have just arrived, and their stories have so much more in common than Dolly Parton than any of Dolly Parton's 32-year-old educated listeners. <laughs> and so I'm seeking to contextualize as part of Nashville's country music story these people from Sudan and Eritrea and Djibouti and from Congo especially. So I, I took it upon myself to learn some music 
You want to play a little something on this one, Joe? You might not know this one. <laughs> I hope no one here really speaks Lingala, because I don't either. <laughs> but I'm going to try. I got this song that goes rock mama like a wagon wheel, and it's real popular, right? And so uh, everyone's always coming up and saying, would you give me a little bit like a, like a kind of a background thing, like a... No, 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 more like, you know, bubbles in my... Okay. What about a little more Days of Our Lives? Thanks. All right, so um, anyway, I've been... My friends, they, they hear this song, Rock Me Mama Like a Wagon Wheel, and then they all want to tell me about it, particularly in inopportune times, like I'm about to catch a flight and I'm late, and they also need me to see their photographs of the evidence and possibly watch a video before I get onto the tarmac. Please, take a look. We were just in Palo Alto, and they played this <laughs> at a bar. Um, and so it's not that that much of a thrill but recently somebody came up to me and said we were just in Vietnam and this singer was there from uh, Bur it was a Burmese singer hanging out in, in Vietnam and he plays Rock Me Mama and he sings it beautifully and we're all from East Tennessee and so it was so meaningful to us when he got to the part about Johnson City and we just felt like we were at home in Vietnam with this Burmese folk singer singing your song and would you also take a look at this and verify it and all that Anyway, I got on the plane and I started thinking about what would it be like if somebody came to Nashville and heard a song that made them feel the way that this family felt when they got to Vietnam? A song that was like a welcome mat. A song that made them say, oh my God, they're playing that song from my town in America, in Nashville. And I thought, I gotta learn such a song. So I've sort of invented this family from Lusaka, Zambia. And they're headed into Nashville and they're so excited. They, they, they heard about Dolly Parton and they're, they're gonna go to the Ryman and they might ride on a pedal tavern. That's real pedal tavern. African pedal okay. tavern. And then they hear it, the strains of the song coming out from the honky tonks and they get out their cell phones and they begin to snap wildly the photos that they can't wait to send home to Lusaka in Zambia and say, take a look, take a look at this. We were made so welcome in Nashville. Questions further down my list is what kind of technology gadgets do you guys use? But I think you, you, you dead ended me on that question before I already asked it. So we'll strike that one from the list. It's the technology of lifting up the needle of a record player, <laughs> and then running it back. Because it took a long time to figure out how to, how to be photographic mimicry on that number. You obviously have such a wide array of, of music uh, influences, and again a lot of homage to kind of the early days of country music and where it came from. But I don't want to put you guys into a box of just being country musicians because you play so many types of music. Can you take us back 
in terms of origin stories and talk a little bit about how Old Crow Medicine Show started, how you guys kind of all brought that sound together. And I've always been interested, you started Old Crow Medicine Show as a teenager in the 90s when grunge rock was all the rage on MTV and you decided to start a kind of an old time string band in the middle of grunge Americana. So you talk a little bit about that origin story and kind of where that, you know, where that inspiration came from. Which way's Windsor? That's where it all began. <laughs> Windsor? Yeah, man. I was, uh, I, was, I was 19 years old, and I got to Windsor. It was 1998, <laughs> that fall. It was, uh, it, was, um, the end, it was just after Canadian Thanksgiving, which we celebrated in Ottawa, which was like the toonies, the loonies, the, the coveted owl on the $50 note. Canadians among us? Come on, Google didn't hire any Canadians? <laughs> uh, shoot, well, we'll work on that, sorry. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure they'll hire some soon. Yeah. <laughs> Our origin story is there only because it happens to be there. But man, we came to Windsor, Ontario, and we were 19, and we had been in a band for like three weeks. And we, we started this band more like a circus, more like a, hey, let's get out of town. Did, you get, did somebody break up with you? Was your heart broken? We, we figured that we would just sort of assemble this bunch of fellas that had all sort of been through the same kind of turnstiles of life at that point and wanted to get out of town. No one was thinking, let's get a record deal. Let's be in a legitimate band. Let's like publish songs and get successful. No, no, we just wanted to get out of the Finger Lakes of New York. Steubenville is a close second. <laughs> it's the thing is, it's just this long winter and 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 what was I even doing up there? Like I'm I'm a I'm a southern boy. I didn't belong there. But the music in Ithaca, New York, in the late '90s, they made me feel as a fiddle player that the fiddle was king. Like every other town made you think, you got to play a rock and you got to play an electric guitar to be a cool guy. But in Ithaca, you could be a violinist and be a cool guy. Those were the hipsters. Like, they were like, <laughs> seriously, y'all. You could be a really busy dude in your, in your, with your little black book, you know what I'm saying? Yep. <laughs> with your old-timey shuck and job and that fiddle and that claw hammer banjo. That's, that's what they were hitting you up over. Mm -hmm. It would, had to be little black books back then. There were no... You couldn't write notes in your phone at that point. No, no, you um, wrote it all down. And what I wrote down was Windsor. Because, all, you know, I'd, I'd been to Canada as a child to, like, you know, look at Niagara Falls and whatnot. But I couldn't wait as an adult. So I started going across the border. The best thing about living in the Finger Lakes was that Canada was only three hours away. And the best thing about playing music in Canada is that they had a $2 coin. Because nobody wants to throw paper. There's no plink. There's no plunk. In Canada, you can not only plink your dollar, you can double your money. I mean, just think about those odds as a busker. Why would you want to go to a place where that's like going to have to... You, have you all ever tipped a busker a dollar? You know you have to ball it up to throw it in there. Mm -hmm. It's like a waste paper basket, you know, basketball shot. The feeling of throwing... And yet, you don't want to throw quarters, because, come on, you're Google. You can, you can spare a little more. Come on. Give your Woodward Street buskers a little bit more to toonies, man. So we wanted to go to Canada. We started going up there to play in, in Kingston, Ontario, and in Cornwall. And, and we played in Quebec. And, man, this $2 coin thing, because we would just, our pockets would just be bulging. We would get to that Tim Hortons, and we'll say, we'll take everything. <laughs> And then we would just put the mountain of change right there by the register and start counting it out, getting rid of the smallest bits first. Throw out your coppers. We were throwing away our pennies in Canada. We were that rich on loonies and toonies. <laughs> we're a busker band. We started on the curb. Sure. And it's just always been part of the ethos of the old crow, no matter how big we got, or even like winning Grammy Awards or playing in... New Zealand or playing, you know, with the Mumford boys in front of 60,000 people. We were always a busker band. I was always thinking about the curb. I always felt like I was on the curb. I feel like I'm on the curb right now. 
<laughs> Anyone have any loonies and toonies we could toss up? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Two dollar coins, y'all. Plink. You're part of the band. You're a percussionist. <laughs> Clink. We got uh, no loonies and toonies, but uh, we g I got you some kombucha earlier. Does that count for anything? Oh, that's that's man. pretty fancy. <laughs> So you've always been a, a busking band. Um, f anyone here been to an Old Crow show live before? Oh, not bad. Oh, you too, huh? yeah? It's actually, this is my daughter Lena here. Her first ever concert last year was an Old Crow Medicine show show. Oh, yeah. Lena, really? Yeah. Yeah, she seems very interested right now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. W now, Lena, where did you see us play music? Do you remember, Lena? How about you, Liv? Do you remember where we were playing? It's the, the Outlaw Fest at oh, DT yeah. last summer. Oh, yeah. Yep, absolutely. In Clarkston, yep, yeah. You yeah. said you said Peppa Pig earlier, so Lena's out now. She's thinking <laughs> Peppa Pig, and she's you've you've lost her, so she'll we'll get her back tomorrow. <laughs> so lots of people who have seen Old Crow Medicine Show Live, some who have not. So can you talk a little bit then how you transition your history of busking on street corners to playing tonight at, uh, at Motor City or playing on a large stage or playing in front of 60,000 people with the Mumford Sons? Well, we just jump around a lot and there's a lot of shouting and hoop hooping it up, you know? It, it really translates really well the curb to the stage because, you know, you learn when you're on the curb, the challenge is, is to get people to, s to stop in their tracks. That's the first skill of the busker is to get to arrest somebody and have them. F and then there's this like, I think a cognitive event that happens in their brains in which they realize that they're at a show, that they're not just pedestrians, but that they're engaged in a performance that they themselves are part of because the performer can't really be performing if no one's listening. That's sort of like the, you know, one hand, you know, you're you're sort of a spiritual dude, right? You know what I'm saying, yeah. right? I know what you're. I don't know what you're saying. I don't know. <laughs> this is the, the 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 when you go out on the curb, you know, you're you're really creating your own jumbotron for everybody to like, or you know, you're making a billboard of yourself, and then you're trying to get everybody to stop and and listen to you and. The real skill is to is to do that in the face of all of the sounds and son and the and the soundscapes of the, of the curb. So, like busking in Detroit. I mean, I don't know that I'd really try that. I went to Windsor, y'all, and I cleaned <laughs> up. But I never came to Detroit to play on the street corner. But I did come to Detroit for Free Friday, the very first one. Remember this now. The year was 1997. Old Crow was just a dream in my in my eyes ears. And Burger King was offering free French fries on one Friday. <laughs> and I woke up that morning, the morning of free Friday in 1997. This was on like January. You can Google this, seriously. This was on like January 4th. I know because I had come with an early version of the Old Crow Medicine Show to play in Michigan that winter. The plan was we're going to circumnavigate Lake Huron. <laughs> right? What a... What a thing to do, right? <laughs> 18, I felt like Admiral Perry, y'all, <laughs> with a fiddle. I was going to go around Lake Huron. Uh, and we only got as far as Sheboygan, Michigan, <laughs> which was, you know, pretty good. Not bad. Um, and it was the dead of winter. I mean, there was like, the, everything was frozen. It was awful. <laughs> we played in this bar on the 2nd of January. Um, and, and it was, you know, it was uh, like a couple of drunks and like a, that was it. And we got paid in pickled eggs. It was brutal. <laughs> well, the next morning, the guys at the, at, the, at the diner where we were spending our last money, last bit of our money, said, we, we're not, we can't do this. We're going back to Virginia. And there was this um, uh, mutiny. And, uh, and so this, the two of the guys, they said, we, and by that time, one of the guys was starting to really go crazy, uh, which was became a theme in, in many bands that I was in. Um, and so he said, I'm going to go to the Detroit bus station, and I'm leaving, and I need you to take me there. And I said, I'm going to circumnavigate Lake Huron. 
Come on, Canada's right there. The Sioux is right there. Let's get on that bridge. What's the name of that bridge? Famous bridge. Come on, Mom. What's the name of that bridge? The Mackinac Bridge. Yeah, yeah, the Mackinac yeah. Bridge, right? Through the Straits, the Mackinac Straits or whatnot, yeah. right? Yeah. Mackinac Straits. <laughs> I mean, we were in Sheboygan, so like right past the saltwater taffy that was going to get opened up in six months, because it's January, was the Mackinac Bridge. But the boys said, no, we got to go to the, the, the... So anyway, we're headed to Detroit. It's like a seven-hour drive from the Straits of Mackinac to Detroit. But thankfully, every single Burger King was going to give us free French fries the whole way, and we stopped at 14 of them. <laughs> and we dropped the naysayer off at the, De at the Detroit bus station. I bet you can see it from here. And, uh, and, he, and he went home to Virginia, and then we went to Windsor, Ontario, and we cleaned up. And that's what made me know that Old Crow Medicine Show was going to go straight there as soon as we got across the border. What was your question again? I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking about uh, your favorite fast food restaurants. Oh, I think you, yeah. I think you nailed it. Let's play um, a song. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I was going to say, you, to you, you guys day. play so many instruments, which I think is so fun. If you guys haven't been to a show, I catch you play five or six instruments, maybe. Eight or nine. Yeah, eight or nine. I'm sorry. My apologies. <laughs> I don't play any, so you've beat me by eight or nine. Um, but I think it's great. You guys play lots of different instruments, and I, I assume that comes from your days of busking and touring. You had to play a little bit of everything, right? Well, I always wanted to be in a band that could pass left or pass right and keep the tune going at the same time. Yeah. That seemed like a good street corner kind of trick. Yeah. You get a lot of extra tunies that way. And, and, you know, the other thing is that this kind of music, it's... I mean, I was never going to be virtuosic on any of my instruments because I didn't start when I was y'all's age. How old are you all? Six. Yeah, so a lot of people, in, in particularly in bluegrass music, they start when they're really little. They start learning how to play the violin. They get super good. But I learned to play the fiddle when I was 18, and I only did it so that I could, so I could draw a crowd and do what I really want to do, which is look everybody in the eye and ask for money. Because <laughs> it turned out I was more of an entertainer than I was a musician. Sure. So I learned how to be an entertainer on about nine different instruments, and I'm pretty decent on them, but I'm not great. If you want to hear the real thing. <laughs> anyway, we're going to play a tune now that, that uh, I talked to Joe earlier this morning on a ride over in the Uber, which he had to call, because I was trying to hail a cab, which you just can't do that in Detroit. Bad idea. <laughs> I got the whiskey, baby, you got the gin. I got the whiskey, baby, you got the gin. Let's both, baby, drink and get drunk again. Hey, whiskey, oh, what'd you say, gin? Hey, whiskey, now oh, what'd you say, gin? Let's both, baby, drink and get drunk again. Baby, you got the gin. I got the whiskey, babe. You got the gin. Let's both, babe, drink and get drunk again. Go, Joe. Ah! Yeah. Yeah. Here's one out of Detroit. Well, I got the washboard and you got the tub. I got the washboard and you got the tub. Let's put them together. And baby, we'll rub, rub, rub. Hey, washboard, now what'd you say, tub? Hey, washboard, now what'd you say, tub? Let's put them together. And baby, we'll rub, rub, rub. When you 
you don't hold back, woman. Honey, on rubbing with me. I got the washboard and you got the tub. I got the washboard and you got the tub. Let's put them together and maybe we'll rub, rub, rub. Toss some coins out for that. We'll toss some <laughs> coins in the hat. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, I read somewhere, Catch, uh, where somebody asked you what your personal influences are or were, and you said uh, Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan, and Bob Dylan. Uh, so I think it's it's really interesting. There's, there's such a, a really unique tie-in between you and Old Crow Medicine Show and Bob Dylan through Wagon Wheel and Sweet Amarillo and 50 Years of Blonde on Blonde. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the connection that you feel with, with Bob and, and some of the kind of history between the two of you? Sure. Well, I always really liked Bob and uh, heard him when I was a kid and I went to see him play for the first time. Um, my mom dropped me off out front in the minivan. It was so <laughs> embarrassing. It was 1990. We were at a, she dropped me off at a basketball arena at the University of Virginia. The ticket cost 1850. I got in the in the concert hall and I'd never I didn't have a Bob Dylan record. I didn't have any reference. All I knew was that I wanted to see this guy. I, I knew I'd heard something about him and I was 12 years old in 1990. Mom drops me off. I go up to the, the nosebleed seats and through the concert. I can't understand a single word the man says <laughs> except for four. Four words, the whole concert, can I, can I make out, discern, hey and mister and tambourine and man. <laughs> and that's all I needed. Four words, the entire cosmos was hung on four words in a Bob Dylan concert. Everything else was inaudible and it didn't matter to me. I knew I left there 12 years old, ready to learn everything that I could about the man and I learned every song I could and I've something of a walking Bob Dylan songbook ever since. That's awesome. And, and uh, Wagon Wheel actually stemmed from kind of a snippet of Bob Dylan that you kind of stumbled across and ended up turning into a full song. So there's dual writing credits on that song, right? You and Bob? Yeah, it's we, pretty we wrote it together with 28 years in between the pen strokes. And, and I, how I understand it is that Bob gives credit to a few folks before him as well that kind of led to inspiration for the song also. And it's very interesting how the dynamic of a song like that comes together over 70, 80, 90 years, right? Well, we, you know, I, as soon as I wrote the song, I felt like it was a, like a keeper, right? And I thought, oh, I'll be playing this one till I'm old and gray. I got to thinking, oh, well, I, we need to go out and play this every chance I get. I, I was 17 when I wrote it, you know? This was like Bob Dylan boot camp was like 12 to 17. <laughs> Full on assault position, ready to absorb everything I could about the guy. Even to the point that I was starting to rewrite songs that he had already written. And Wagon Wheel wasn't the first one I did. The first one I did was, um, well, I'd, I'd, there was a number of them, but like I rewrote It's All Right, Ma, I'm Only Bleeding and uh, a couple others. Um, but I was already in that practice because I'd heard a lot of music as a kid and I, re I rewrote the Lord's Prayer too. I mean, I was just one of those kind of minds that wanted to tinker with words. I'd hear it, I liked it, I was really into jingles, you know, who could ask for anything more? Oh, what a feeling. And y'all weren't around then or y'all would have had <laughs> the best blank stares on Googles those. on the block. <laughs> I don't mean you weren't around, I mean Google wasn't around. You guys would have had such great jingles. Sure. You write a Google jingle for us? I miss the Google, the jingle era. Y'all yeah. ought to bring that back. God, I'm full of good ideas this morning. Hmm? I'm just full of good ideas this morning. Oh, man. <laughs> like, that's like highly marketable right there. We could make a fortune selling jingles to Google. <laughs> well, you could be Google's jingle consultant. Oh my God! I would. That would be. Thanks so much for asking me <laughs> to be your new jingle consultant, Google. I'm. I'm just honored that you would think of that. I'm right. glad to be the your co-consultant. Yeah, co-chair. We'll Welcome aboard. aboard. We'll okay. What are we talking about? <laughs> oh yeah. So I'd written a lot of jingles before about Bob Dylan there stuff, and I, 
the the sort of effervescence of my brain was full of a fizzy bob folk music bubble kind of thing um and so i started i thought oh let's um well then we moved to nashville and we were singing the song on the street corner and everything everybody liked rocking mama like a wagon wheel so then it was time to publish it so we got somebody to get a hold of bob's people and bob immediately wrote back saying that he didn't write the song that instead it had been written by a, um, a 1950s R&B king out of Memphis named um, Arthur, named, uh, named Arthur Crudup, Big Boy Crudup, same guy that wrote uh, hey, "Let's Hold Right, Mama" for Elvis. Um, and then, so I listened to his song. I mean, it really didn't sound anything like it. And then you realize that Bob's like the Cheshire Cat, sort of saying, "Oh no, I'm over there right now." <laughs> but sir, you're right there. No, no, no I'm there. <laughs> So he's sort of so he's he did that right and then but in the liner notes to the Arthur Bo Arthur Crudup record he said that he hadn't written the song either that he had learned it from Big Bill Brunsey who recorded in Chicago in the 1920s. So if you include Darius Rucker in the mix, the song took 90 years to go number one, <laughs> and in its near century-long gestation, sees shared authorship and interpretation among three African Americans and a Jewish musical icon, and me, the skinny white kid from Virginia. <laughs> That's how a song's written, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's how you do it, kids. <laughs> In case you were wondering, dig into the 1920s music catalog and work on it from there, right? Perfect. Uh, speaking of your writing, I don't know if you noticed, but we've got uh, your book, Catch, sitting right here. Yeah, um, this is my first work, y'all. This is beautiful, yeah. So it's called Lorraine, the Girl Who Sang the Storm Away. Um, written by you, but also, uh, interestingly, uh, illustrated by the great Higgins Bond as well, um, who I think some people might not know by the name, but they know some of her illustrations and some of the work she's done. Um, can you talk a little bit about the book and, and also maybe a little bit about there. Higgins as well? Bring well, it on. this is a, I always, you know, I'm really, uh, I've got kids and I, and I love children's stories and children's books were really important to me. I was an avid reader. How about you two? Are you all avid readers? You like to read at home? Absolutely. I like to read at home too, and I liked, I really liked writing this book. This is my wonderful um, illustrator, Higgins Bond. She's the first African American woman to design a U.S. postage stamp, went on to make four of them for the United States Postal, <coughs> Postal Service. And it's got this wonderful illustrations. I really wanted to have there be a children's book in which Granddad was named Paw Paw. <laughs> because when I grew up, all of the children's books granddad was named grandfather and he lived in a 57 story high rise in New York City <laughs> right aren't all the children's books about living in New York yeah. what's up with that yeah. I don't live in New York I didn't want to live in New York I don't live in New York and my children don't live in New York they don't take subways or elevators they don't live in apartments they live in houses uh, and uh, and they drive through pastoral countrysides often and they um, you know the New York childhood, sure, that's, that, there's a lot of publishing in New York, and there's a lot of wonderful things to say about a New York childhood, but I didn't have one. And besides, I think if you compared the literacy rates between New York childhoods and Tennessee ones, you'd see that we need a lot more books in Tennessee <laughs> and maybe some fewer in New York City. So I wanted to see a Tennessee childhood in this. I'm just flash, flashing through it so that you'll know that you can go to your favorite... Um, independent book retailer and purchase this book <laughs> and if you do every dollar that you spend on this book will go to support the school that I started in my neighborhood yeah it's called the thanks about four years ago we opened the doors to the nation's newest Episcopal school and it's called the Episcopal School of Nashville and I'm the founder and the chairman of the board y'all as if I have time for that but come on <laughs> I found a 23rd hour in the day, I mean, 26th. And I and in that in that I I'm hustling it, y'all. I'm a natural hustler from the curb, from the streets of Windsor. <laughs> from the streets of Windsor to opening schools in Nashville. I appreciate it. Um let me just ask uh do you guys can I ask you to play another song? Yeah, we're going to do one more for you and and before before we do, I I got um I'm going to tell you just a quick story. We've been uh I've been having a lot of fun playing this violin. This violin belonged to a great country music maker named Roy Acuff. And Roy gave it to a, a young cat who's now an old cat. 
and that old cat gave it to me, and someday I'll give it to some young cat too. Um, in the uh, in the excitement and hoopla over um, Lil Nas X's song "Old Town Road" earlier this summer, um, we went to the Grand Ol- we went to Bonnaroo to play, and we'd worked up "Old Town Road" into the set, and uh, um, we started. Uh, we started playing it, and you know it's Bonnaroo, so it's a real young crowd. Everybody likes it, but there were other audiences that we would play it, and you know you could see the polarization that the song created in the in the longtime listeners of country music, and then the new kind of hip young listeners who who didn't care if it was country or not, and the old folks who might want to you know keep keep it all separate. Um, but every time that I would play it, I would always make sure everyone knew that I had just played it on Roy Acuff's fiddle. So in case there was any question or concern about whether it was country music or not, that Roy Acuff's fiddle had the last word. Um, so anyway, we're not going to play that song right now because I've since <laughs> forgotten all of the, the, um, those rhymes. They probably know it, though. Do you guys know that one? <laughs> they do. They, they like do. to dance to it. I don't know if they, they know do. the words, they but they love dancing <laughs> to it. So, so uh, anyway, we're going to play something on Roy Acuff's fiddle for you now. Seventeen hours, I'm picking me a bouquet of dogwood flowers. Well, I'm hoping for Riley. I see my baby tonight. Oh, right, so rock me, mama, like a wagon wheel. Rock me, mama, any way you feel. Hey, mama, rock me. We're singing, rock me, mama, like the wind and the rain. Rock. Like a southbound train, hey, mama, rock me. I'm running from the cold up in New England. I was born to be a fiddler in an old timey string, man. My baby plays the guitar. I pick a banjo now All of them North Country winners been a getting me I lost my money playing poker So I had you up and eat But I ain't turning back To live that old life no more Oh no, so rock me mama Like a wagon wheel Rock me mama any way you feel Hey, mama rock me Southbound train, hey, Mama rack me, yo. Hey. Walking due south out of Roanoke, I caught a trucker out of Philly, had a nice long tow. But he's headed west from the Cumberland Gap to Johnson City in Tennessee. And I gotta get a move on before the sun. I got my baby calling my name. I know that she's the only one. And if I die in Riley, at least I will die free. So rock me, mama, like a wagon wheel. Rock me, mama, any way you feel. Hey. Mama, rock me. Oh, they sing it. Rock me, mama, like the wind and the rain. Rock me, mama, like a southbound train. Hey, mama, rock me. Thank you. 
Thanks, guys. That was awesome. Um, any any audience questions? Want to open up just to see if we have maybe one or two audience questions? Here comes Laura. Thank you for playing Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain. My dad sang that song to me my whole life growing up, so that was really special. Oh, it's also one of that. my favorite songs, too, so thank you as well. And then remember how you said you'd play Chris Christopherson? Oh, yeah. You got it in you still? That's sure, my question. Yeah. Can you? <laughs> thank you. <Yeah. laughs> we can. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> they can't get it up. Thank you. One time we were playing at Bonnaroo, and, and Chris was there, and and uh, he was watching. He was, oh, I know, because we were playing with John Prine, and I was blowing harmonica, and John Prine was watching, and it was so great, and he came up, and he gave me a big hug afterwards. I hope that there's something in, in, in y'all's work that feels somewhere in that realm, just because it's the greatest feeling for a person to have a, a job in which they can get a hug from Chris Christopherson. <laughs> and I don't know what the equivalent is for that at Google Detroit, <laughs> but um, surely there's something that can happen here that can make you feel something similar. Um, I know that I've brushed my teeth down here at the <laughs> Google bathroom, <laughs> and the feeling that I had of using those free single-serving Colgate packets <laughs> And talking with the dishwasher while I brush was such a great and refreshing feeling. And that's sort of what I'm talking about. Every, every morning you could do that here at Google, Joe, if this was your job instead of touring with the Old Crow Medicine Show. You could just live here. Do people live here? I think there's a few people that live here, yeah. Heidner, I think, lives here most of the time. Yeah. Pretty much. Buzz of fat and Baton Rouge, waiting for a train. Feeling nearly faded as my jeans. Bobby thumbed a diesel down just before it rained. Got us all the way to New Orleans. Well, I pulled my harpoon out of my dirty red bandana. I was singing soft while Bobby sang the blues. Slapping time, I was holding Bobby's hand in mine. We sang every song that driver knew. Freedom, just another word for nothing left to lose. Nothing ain't worth nothing, but it's free. You know, feeling good was easy, Lord, when Bobby sang the blues. And feeling good was good enough for me. Got enough for me and Bobby McGee. Now from the Kentucky coal mines to the California sun, Bobby shared the secrets of my soul. Through all kinds of weather and everything we've done, Bobby kept me from the cold. slip away she's looking for a home i hope she finds it i trade a month of tomorrows for one single yesterday to be holding her body close to mine freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose nothing ain't worth nothing but it's free Feeling good was good enough for me. Yeah, good enough for me and Bobby McGee. La 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 Bobby McGee. La 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 Bobby McGee.
by request. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you, Laura. I think we have one more question. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you so much for taking this time. This has been incredible. I don't know if you've noticed me and the girl in the orange have been crying the entire time because we cry I, when we're I happy. Have, yes, <laughs> I have. So thank you, Heidner. Um, but I just was wondering, like, if you could go back to when you're 18 in Windsor and you're like getting started and obviously you go through highs and lows in life, what's one piece of advice you would tell that 18 year old boy to mm. kind of get you through the highs and the lows? Oh, I, thanks. That's a great question. I mean, I would definitely tell that kid not to sweat it because the problem is, is that I did sweat it. <laughs> I sweated every part of it. Yeah. I didn't know if, if, any of it was going to happen and I fretted that it might not mm -hmm. and I and and yet it did happen and it didn't require me to lose any sleep over any moment of it not none of it mm -hmm. it all was going to be just what it was and and uh, so I wish I could have saved myself a little bit of that sleeplessness or despair or grief and mm -hmm. uh, just by saying hey man it's it's all going to turn out the way it's supposed to I'd have, I'd have told him that I love it. Thank you. I needed to hear that too. So <laughs> thank awesome. you. Well, Joe, Catch, thank you so much uh, for coming in this Friday afternoon. We really appreciate it. This, is, this has been absolutely awesome. I speak for everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your days to come over here and share it with us. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Secor, thank you as well for coming. It's always nice. The first parents we've had in of a guest ever before too. So thank you guys. One more round of applause for the guys from Old Co. Medicine Co. All right. All right. Go Tigs. This could be the year, y'all. <laughs>